the Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts designed to revitalize the role of literature in American culture and to encourage citizens to read for pleasure and enlightenment. The Big Read is managed by Arts Midwest, and the Sumter County Library is one of 77 nonprofit organizations that was chosen in this latest grant cycle to do a Big Read. I want to express thanks on behalf of the library to Dolores Pringle, who is a member of the Library Board of Trustees. Um, I believe she has been out of the country and is unable to be here this evening, but she wrote the successful grant application that was awarded the Big Read grant. So I want to again thank her. She also wrote the successful grant application for the King James project that we had last year. So she has certainly been doing a lot of great things for the library. We really do appreciate it. Um, so we're kicking things off in the novel that Dolores chose to submit the application for was The Great Wrath by John Steinbeck. And we have a panel this evening that's going to kick things off for us and um, lead a discussion on the book. And I want to go ahead and introduce each one of them, starting with um, Dr. Belinda Littlefield, who is an Associate Professor of History and Director of the African Studies Program at the University of South Carolina, Columbia. Dr. Littlefield earned her BA at North Carolina Central University in both political science and history. She earned a PhD in history with her major field in African American history since 1815 and minor fields in U.S. National and History of Education at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Littlefield is the co-author of a three-volume anthology, South Carolina Women, Their Lives and Times. And then we have Mr. Luther Barnett, who holds a BA in English from the College of Charleston and an MA in Education from the University of South Carolina. He has taught at Sumter High since 1997 and has taught advanced IB English courses and broadcast media. He is the president of the Sumter Schools Education Association. He has taken part in productions at the Sumter Little Theater in his spare time. And we have Karen Edgar. Karen is a native of New Jersey by birth, but a South Carolinian of 23 years by choice. She has her MLIS from USC's Davis College. Karen has been an employee of the Sumter County Library and head of children's services for over a decade. Her all-time favorite author is John Steinbeck. Her all-time favorite novel is The Grapes of Wrath. And her all-time <laughs> favorite movie is The Grapes of Wrath. And before I turn things over to the to our panel, um, speaking of Karen's all-time favorite movie, The Grapes of Wrath, is part of the programs, and we have a schedule of all the different events that we're having in the back of the room if you want to pick one up. But the next one will be this Friday at the Opera House, where we'll be doing a screening of the 1940 film version of The Grapes of Wrath, starring Henry Fonda. So I'm sure Karen will, will be there since that's her all-time favorite movie. The, before, one more thing before I turn things over. If the room feels too warm, I can bump up the air conditioning. But if everything's all right, I'll just leave it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, how are you? I don't beat myself up getting <laughs> I'm going to show, I think, about 10 to 12 slides. I'm the historian, so I'm going to put you in, I'm going to take you back uh, and give you a little background information and put us in the mood to talk about the book. So I'm going to go from there. When you talk about the, the Great Depression, hopefully I'm going to do that. When you talk about the Great Depression, one of the things that you automatically think about is the Dust Bowl, and, and that period is also called the Dirty Thirties. Uh, and so that's one of the things that, that I want to talk to you a little bit about today. But see if this is going to take me where I want to go. No. My techie person? Okay. <laughs> okay. You don't need to know about social studies unless you um, teach them in my school. I work a lot with school teachers, so I do most of my slides start with standards. When you talk about the Great Depression, you have to think about 
overexpansion in major industries, uneven distribution of wealth, um, weak banking and corporate structure, and you also got growth of monopolies. And there is a lack of knowledge about economic systems and how they work. Can everybody hear me in the back? I have a pretty loud voice. So. This is unemployment, and I teach African American history, so this is one of the groups that I look at in particular. Uh, it ran as high as 50% among African Americans, but millions of Americans moved from rural to urban areas looking for jobs. Uh, others moved from eastern to western areas uh, seeking work, and this is where Grapes of Wrath uh, falls in. Uh, in an effort to save jobs, the United States, believe it or not, sent uh, Mexicans, <coughs> Latinos, and other groups back to their countries, even if they were U.S. citizens. So it has also a, 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 an underside that's, that's not pretty either. Millions of Americans wandered the streets of major cities. You've got 85,000 businesses that failed just between 1929 and 1932. And this last figure, when you think about national income, it dropped from 81 billion to 41 billion. This is another, this is a graph I use to, to get people to understand uh, what I've already told you, but when you look at it in the visual, sometimes it's a much better way of, of examining it. So when you're looking at business failures, you can look at 1929, and then, uh, you know, you, you just see what's happening uh, there. 1932, we, we have a spike, and we can talk about that. 1920s, you've got, a, it's, it was a boom time, we had a bull market, speculation is rampant. Very little government regulation or concern. In other words, if you wanted to buy stocks, you could buy them on time. You could pay, you know, little down, and then your stocks would rise. You're taking a chance. But the bottom line is, lots of people could could uh, play with stocks. Corporate profits at an all-time high. There is a gap between the middle and the working class, and it widens. One percent of the population own thirty-six percent of the wealth. And I often ask my students to think about then and now. <laughs> Farmers were overproducing and prices for produce were down. Banks were failing at an alarming rate. And unemployment was becoming a problem as early as 1929. Credit buying. I'm going to show you, a, I think I have a slide on credit buying. It just kept going up. And all of these industries like corporations, stock market, banks, they're, they're not checked. This is a time when the government thinks that they should keep their hands off of it. You just let this is do what it should do, as we should say. This one you probably can't see that well. These are just unemployment statistics. Uh, I'm going to skip this one because that means I need to get another one in here. Here's another one that you can't see. This is consumer borrowing. So look at 1920 and then look at 1928 and then this one. Can I, if I do that, will it lose me? 1929. You see that one? That's a huge increase in consumer borrowing. So 2.5 percent billion. This is billions. 1920, 1922, three. 1924, 4.5 billion. 1926, six. 1928, 7.3. And by 1929, you're up to 8.1 billion. This is just consumer borrowing. So you can see we're we're in trouble here. All that we needed to send the nation into a serious economic decline wasn't a catastrophic event like the Great Depression. So when the stock market begins to weaken in 1929, in September, by October, the bottom falls out. And you have investors losing over $40 billion almost immediately. That is a shock. At first, President Hoover, believing like most government officials did, leave it alone, it's going to take care of itself, it'll be okay. Uh, and, and so finally, by 1932, he starts to act. This is from 1929. Um, his action did very, uh, did some improvement, but didn't do a lot. And in 1932, you got Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin, Hoover was trying to get Franklin to do some things. Franklin didn't want Hoover to do some things. So you've got this tension going on with people trying to get into power. Uh, Roosevelt does win by 57% of the popular vote. The general thinking was that only the power and might of the federal government 
to solve the economic crisis. So we've moved from individual from ideas of individuals taking care of things and letting the businesses take care of things on their own, things would work out, and saying this is much bigger than everything that we've attacked before. So federal government is the only institution that can handle this. And so what Roosevelt promised was a new deal uh, for the American people. And what he did was introduce massive new programs between 1933 and 1941. We all know the alphabet soup, some worked, some didn't. He was a practical man. So he would try something, if it didn't work, he'd toss it out and try something else. Uh, you're at a time when you, when you do need people to just be uh, pragmatic about certain things. This is one of those cartoons which uh, I like to use editorial cartoons, especially for younger people. But old people like cartoons too, like myself. I'm a cartoon nut. Uh, that New Deal, you wanted action, and this is Roosevelt just throwing out ideas, okay? And this is Uncle Sam, of course, saying, whoa! And that happened as well. Uh, this is another image of, of Roosevelt at the very top. Congress is, is the mule, and the mule is you know, sad and sick and tired, and he's delivering the economy, he's, he's delivering certain things that would get the economic system back up and running. And of course, when Roosevelt gets there, the mule takes off. This is another image of Roosevelt delivering the, the nation. What a man. So he he's, has these banks, he's got the bank uh, corporations, he's got unemployment, uh, he's got all of these and he's pulling them to prosperity. This line here says the, uh, to fort pro prosperity. There's a wonderful film about uh, hobos and uh, the song Big Red Candy Mountain uh, talks a lot about prosperity just around the corner and I'd like to know which corner. Uh, it's, it's a great one. The uh, Dirty Thirties. This is just an image of farm equipment covered by dust. And so you can see how deep uh, layers of dust could be. This is an image of uh, Dorothy Lang took lots of pictures of, uh, of the Depression. Uh, this is a woman uh, who was a refugee uh, moving from Oklahoma uh, somewhere else trying to get to California. Uh, these are three of her daughters. She actually has seven children. Uh, and so again, you're talking about a time when people had lots of children, uh, and they're and they're basically destitute. And so this captures uh, this woman just kind of just hanging on. Her car is being fixed, but she's just not sure what her future is like. Falling prices for wheat during the 1920s meant farmers produced more to get by, so they broke land. And one of the things that you look at this is this this land that became the Dust Bowl is where farmers. Uh, figured out that wheat would grow really quite well, but it was not holding the soil in like the, the natural uh, grass that was there. And so when you look at the number of decades that this happened, when the drought period comes, it comes with a vengeance and we get the dirty 30s. It starts in Montana and the Dakotas in 1931 and it spreads. Between 1910 and 1930, the Great Plains farmers had begun to create an ecological time bomb and this is when it explodes in the 1930s. So you've got this booming wheat market uh, during the World War I, convinced them to plow up the plains uh, and the land of his native grasses. The worst section hit was the southern plains, the Dust Bowl, parts of Colorado, New Mexico, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, which John Stanback talks about, especially Oklahoma. The most severe storm was during the spring of 1935. The storms peaked on April 14, 1935, and they called it Black Sunday, because you literally could not see. Um, a swirling curtain of dust created by the winds in Colorado and campus turned daylight to dark. Imagine this, dirt coating people's mouths, lungs, and food. Cattle suffocated and died. Chickens roosted in the day. Students studied during the day by lamplight and often did not leave schools when storms appeared for fear of being lost, being killed, lost or killed. When you see old westerns with uh, especially snow and you've got rope where people figure out how to get, a lot of times during the dust storm, rope was put up so that students and others could find their way back to their homes. The dust from the plains fell as far away as New York, D.C., and Canada. This is a tremendous uh, catastrophe. The result was that many bold farmers, these are people who had, had moved from the south and other parts of the country 
to the north, uh, to the Midwest, uh, looking for a better life. Um, so what happens is when the Dust Bowl occurs, you have them being evicted, because many of them were tenants. Uh, oil field workers and others moved in search of work because you can't drill for oil when the Dust Bowl, when the uh, Dust Bowl is, is, being, is happening. And many moved to California, which is again part of Grapes of Wrath. Californians historically have not proven generous in hard times. Uh, they had before that excluded Chinese, Japanese, and Mexican immigrants, and they now literally tried to close their borders to white native born Americans. It took Congress to tell the shirt, you can't do that, that's illegal. Um, so in 1936, the LA police chief sent police officers to set up a bomb blockade on the state's borders, and that lasted six weeks. And again, that didn't get brought down until you had the federal government who stepped in and said, you can't, these are American citizens, you cannot do that. There were signs everywhere that said, no Okies, no, no dogs, no niggers. And this was in any establishment you went to in California. So these are the kinds of things that, are, that these people are having to face that comes out uh, in the conversation uh, that Standback talks about. And Standback is very sympathetic to, the, to their plight. And so I wanted to give you a little background uh, of, a little historical background. But that's what we're looking at, and this is where Standback comes into play. Hi. Um, you guys are a little bit older than my, my normal pair. <laughs> So, you know, I, I've been <clears throat> teaching at uh, Central High School for about 18, 17, 18 years, something like that. And my, my familiarity with Steinbeck has been primarily with Mice and Men, which is taught in English too, and I taught for years. Um, and I also participated in the uh, Sumter Little Theater performance of uh, uh, Mice and Men. It was the only time that somebody actually called me slim. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, when um, Ford called me and asked me about talking about the Grapes of Wrath, I, I was like, well, you know, I'm not a Steinbeck aficionado, uh, but I started looking into the book and, 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 and experiencing it. I even got an, an audio book, which if you haven't experienced that, it's kind of fun, uh, to, to, especially if you have a good actor um, who's doing the, the, the reading. Um, and I've been reading some, uh, some essays and, and I've been watching the film version as well. Um, I teach broadcast media, which is a, a partially a film studies class. And I hadn't taught uh, The Grapes of Wrath, which was directed by John Ford. Uh, and you guys will have the opportunity to watch it on Friday if you haven't seen it. Um, but uh, I do teach Citizen Kane, which uh, was Orson Welles' tour de force film that was produced in 1941, the following year. Um, and so I am going to talk a little bit about some, some similarities, because actually uh, Greg Tolan, who is the cinematographer for The Grace of Wrath, was also the cinematographer for uh, Susan Kane. Um, so what are some things that, that I learned as I was kind of examining The Grace of Wrath and kind of finding out some things about the novel and the, and the film? Um, one thing that I found really interesting was is that Steinbeck had actually written another book prior to The Grapes of Wrath that was the book that he was contracted to write um, called La Fair Lettuceburg, which was a uh, harsh satire uh, that was taking aim at the, uh, the landowners um, in California. And um, his wife told him that he needed to burn the book. Um, and, and he wrote a letter to, um, to his publisher, his, his publisher, saying that he didn't feel that, you know, he, he knew that they might feel that he was breaking a contract, but he felt that if he published this book, that he would be betraying uh, the essence of what he needed to do as a writer. Um, so he scrapped Le Fair, Lettuceburg, and then he wrote The Grapes of Wrath, which he wrote in approximately uh, about five months. If I remember correctly, um, uh, so you know, and the book came out and it became a smashing success. It was being, you know, it was, it was bought widely, and within a year uh, or so, the, the film was produced in 1940. Um, so, what are some things that are interesting 
within the book. Uh, one of the things that struck me was, um, you know, it's a it's got a pretty blatant Christ figure in it with uh, Jim Casey, and and, um, and I think that his character is, you know, one that we've seen before in other works of literature. Uh, for those of you who have ever read The Red Badge of Courage, uh, you have another Christ figure in that book by Stephen Crane, uh, Jim Conklin. Um, and it's interesting to see how the writers use these, these Christ figures and, and how these Christ figures influence the protagonist, in this case, uh, uh, Tom Joad and, 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 um, and Red Badge of Courage Henry. Um, and ultimately, it is the interaction between Jim Casey and Tom Joad that causes Tom Joad to transcend uh, his individualism um, and, and expand to the group mindset, which is exactly what Steinbeck is working towards. Um, you know, and, and it's certainly something that we see in what you were talking about with the New Deal, which, you know, which is we have to stop saying we're in it by ourselves and we have to start thinking about us working together um, as, as a family and as a nation. Um, and, and I think Steinbeck really bought into the New Deal and bought into what Roosevelt was working towards. Um, uh, but, interestingly enough, this is a major difference between the film and the book. Um, the book does not end with Tom Joe. The book ends with Rosa Sharon. And I think that that is a really fascinating way to end the book. Um, I was talking to some of my, my fellow English teachers um, and you know, I told them that I was looking into Grace Wrath, and, and a couple of them said, great book, what was going on with that ending? <laughs> you know, and, and I think that the ending is disturbing, um, but incredibly sweet and, and human at the same time. So, you know, one question that you guys might think about this month as you're thinking about the Greatest Wrath is, is why did Steinbeck kind of end this way? Um, and, and in this way, I think it's a celebration of women um, in America. And, and what we see in the course of the novel and in, in the film to some degree is we see the loss of the position of power of the patriarch and the ascension of the matriarch. Ma Jode, at the end of the novel, is the one that's in charge of the family. And, you know, just like Jim Casey is teaching Tom to reach a new position, to have a new insight into life, Ma is teaching Rosa Sharon. And at the end of the novel where we see this, this man that is, you know, reached a state where he can't even really move, he's so hungry, um, and we see her breastfeed growing man, and we see this kind of inverted image of the mother figure, where we don't see a baby, you know, we see, we see a grown man, it, it, it is disturbing, but it really seems to work with this idea of the ascension of the woman, and, and the idea that the woman understands the essence of family, and that idea of the essence of family should transcend to the understanding of the essence of country, um, that we have to think as a group. Um, the film, interestingly enough, if you if you go back and watch the film Friday, or if you decide that you want to you know, get your own copy and, and watch it at home, um, one of the things that is really fascinating is, is the very first image of the film uh, is an image of Tom walking down the road by himself, which is the essence of the isolated man. And of course, everything moves towards the idea of the group identity at the end. Um, what are some other things uh, that I noticed? Um, another, another real stark difference between the film and the book is some of the decisions by the screenwriters um, with how they ordered events. Now, the structure of the novel, which is an interesting structure, is that, that Steinbeck weaves together the story of the Jodes with these vignettes. 
And, and so what you have is you have a, a, a vignette which is a general commentary on the nature of what's happening with the Dust Bowl or what's happening with the migrants or what's happening in California itself, how California is changing, um, what it means to take cotton, you know, that, that kind of thing. And then you'll see the Jodes in between. And, and there are 30 chapters in the novel. The, the 15th chapter is where you see the, the actual meshing of the two, which is the, uh, the diner chapter uh, with Al and May, which is it's a, it's a fascinating, beautiful chapter, beautifully written. Um, and that's the one time where you see the Jodes kind of actually infused into that, that, that general vignette. And the idea was for Steinbeck was he wanted to show the personal story that of this, you know, this, this poor family on an epic scale. And he wanted to give the individual, but he wanted to show that the individual was was directly connected to the general story that's happening to everybody, you know, within the this, this experience of, of the uh, the migration. Um, with the book, they're doing the same kind of thing. They cut out a lot of vignettes, like they cut out the one-eyed man, um, you know, but they have the Alan May section. Um, but in in the film. They arrive at the peach orchard in uh, in California uh, before they go to the government camp, and the government camp is really presented as being this kind of it's like the one place where they're actually treated as human beings, um, uh, and they, they have they, they're able to create their own committees and they have their own you know their own sheriffs and you know they're able to manage themselves, so. In the book, um, they go to the government camp first, and then they leave the government camp and they go to this peach orchard, where you know this is where John, uh, Jim Casey dies, and, and this is where Tom has you know they have to flee because Tom kills the man that killed Casey, and and but they chose in, in the, the construction of the film to reverse that, and and I, I think that the reason they did that is because the, the government camp is more uplifting. And I think that they were trying to make it more palatable, you know, because what you don't see in the film is you don't see a flood. You don't see the family trying desperately to not be flooded out as they're living in a boxcar. You don't see them rushing to a barn where there's a man dying of hunger, and you don't see Rosa Sharon breastfeeding this man. All of that's not in the film. And, and they had to make that choice, I think, you know, which was a practical choice in the sense of how are you going to manage to put this out, you know, for the public, and, and how do you film it, and how do you, you know, how do you deal with the issues of censorship and so on, which you know were realistic ones. Um, for those of you who don't know, the film was nominated for seven uh, seven Oscars. Um, it only won two, one for John Ford who directed it, and uh, the other was for Jane Darwell who played Macho does an outstanding job. Um, Henry Fonda was, did not win. Uh, he was nominated. Um, uh, Jimmy Stewart won that year for the Philadelphia story. And, um, and there's some really great commentary. If you get yourself a DVD, you can actually listen to the commentary. And there's like a Henry Ford, uh, um, excuse me, a John Ford expert and an expert on Swan Steinbeck. And they're going back and forth. And you get a lot of great details. Um, but the, uh, the the film historian said that Jimmy Stewart uh, had done um, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington the previous year, and he did not win the Oscar. And this was kind of like their way of making up for it, you know, because uh, Clark Gable won the year before with Gone with the Wind. Um, another thing that was really interesting that, that I kind of found out was, was John Ford and Steinbeck's kind of history, because John Ford was very in tune with the essence of what the Great Scrap was about. Um, his first job in Hollywood was digging ditches. Uh, you know, and, and he was very much connected to the idea of labor. Um, and he was also very influenced by his Irish Catholic, you know, his Irish background. Um, you know, and I slipped into Irish Catholic there, not every Irish, but it's Catholic, you know, obviously. You're aware of the troubles, I'm sure. Um, but Steinbeck, uh, he had his, his, one of his first jobs in California was um, working a construction job helping to make Highway 1. Um, and both of these men really believed in kind of going to 
uh, going into the workforce, understanding the workforce. Um, and Steinbeck believed that the only true heroes could be found in the poor. You know, um, he he believed that the way that storytelling had, you know, the way that things had transcended, uh, or uh, the way that things had progressed in the nation, that the, where you're going to find true heroism was with somebody that understood what it was to scrape by every day. Um, and in both, uh, in many of his stories, the, the landowners, the, the, uh, the people that have money, um, are presented as being um, negative. Certainly so in Of Mice and Men, you know, where you have Curly, uh, who's the son of the, uh, the owner of the ranch, who's the, the, the antagonist. Um, Talking about um, filming, uh, and I mentioned Greg Tolan earlier as the cinematographer. Um, one of the things that I see when I teach Susan Kane is just, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that Wells was pushing this, um, but Wells was very interested in this idea of light and dark, the use of shadow, um, and and if you watch Susan Kane, you don't see. For instance, the reporter spaces, they're always masked in shadows, and, and, and it's, it turns out to be a, a nice little bit of allegory in the sense that they don't really understand Cain, even though they're the ones that are kind of researching him. Um, and they do some similar things in Grapes of Wrath, even though a lot of, of, of the story uh, does take place in the wide open and you do have a lot of light. Um, but if you watch the beginning of the film, uh, when um, Tom and Casey arrive, at the Jode farm and, and it's abandoned um, and they go in, uh, there's a lot of work with this very, very soft light. He's carrying a candle. And they did they did that with an electric light. Um, but but the the very the focus on the idea of light and dark is something that a lot of older filmmakers, especially in black and white, would, would use uh, symbolically. Um, another thing that I did notice about the, the film versus um, Ruth, Ruthie, and Winfield. In the novel, they are much more prominent, much more developed characters. They have a lot more depth, and I, I don't think they just—I don't think they have time. Um, they're just kids in the film. Every now and then, you look over and you see them. They're on the truck, you know, but we don't see them a great deal. They look hungry. That's about it. Um, uh, The other thing that I was thinking about, I, my, my, my master's from USC is actually in English. Um, and my master's thesis was on three African-American novels, uh, Native Son, Invisible Man, and um, Linden Hills by Gloria Allen. And Native Son was written in 1940 by Richard Wright. And one of the things that I was really fascinated by as I was kind of going through grapes is the focus on communism. Um, and Wright, of course, was vastly interested in that subject as well. Very, he was attracted to the communist movement. And, and then Ellison, of course, is looking at the same thing in 1950 when he publishes Invisible Man. Um, and how the communist movement was attractive to African Americans and why. Um, and how certain members of that movement were just appropriating African Americans to advance their, their own agendas. Um, and in both cases, in both of those novels, you see that. And what you see in the grapes is, is that you have the, the Okies, you know, and represented by the Jodes, who are just decent, hardworking people that want to work for a living. Just, I'll work, you pay me. And they're being called Reds. And they don't, they don't, even, they don't even know what a Red is. You know, and there's this really interesting idea of how we will take certain tags and uh, label people that we don't like for whatever reason, they're threatening, they're threatening my ownership or whatever. Um, and, and I think Steinbeck was very interested in that, um, you know, and wanted to call to task those people that were advancing propaganda against the Okies and calling them communists. Now, what were the uh, ramifications of that? Uh, Steinbeck, uh, of course, was investigated by Hoover. Um, and he, uh, he was not able to um, join the armed forces in World War II. So he was like cut out. Uh, and he eventually was only able to go as, as a journalist um, in covering it. 
Um, so, you know, in that sense, uh, he was putting himself out there and, and would be late, later investigated, and, you know, for possibly being connected to the communist movement. Um, <laughs> this is a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, I first read The Grapes of Wrath uh, when I was in the sixth grade. Uh, and I've been fascinated with it ever since. Um, what I find interesting is the symbolism in the story. And there's so much of it. Uh, I'm particularly taken with the turtle. We see it twice in the story. Uh, the first time, it's uh, making its way across a highway. And I think it symbolizes uh, several things. It symbolizes the strength of the people, um, survival, because we see two different drivers approaching that turtle. The lady driver swerves out of the way so she doesn't hit the turtle. That represents the good in people. Uh, the second driver deliberately swerves to hit the turtle, which he only clips enough for the turtle to flip over on its shell. That represents the bad in people. And later on when Tom finds the turtle, thinking he's going to give it to his little brother and sister, he decides instead to free it. And it heads up uh, the highway going west. That represents the migrants, whether they're from Oklahoma or wherever, these were the migrants. And I think that is the start of letting us know that the ultimate uh, message to me in the story is survival. Ma certainly uh, explains that when she said we are, we're the people and we're going to keep going and we'll always be there. Uh, another uh, symbol is the dog, the family dog, which the family rarely admits they never quite bonded with. And the dog, uh, of course, is killed um, by a fast-moving car and is left to struggle in the road until Tom drags it by its feet and the kindness of the storekeeper who said he will bury the dog. This represents the struggles that the migrants are about to face as they go west. Um, I think the obvious uh, symbolism is the biblical. Uh, Jim Casey, JC, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, when we meet Jim and we meet Tom in the beginning at the farmstead, um, Tom is someone who lives in the present. But by, uh, by the end of the novel, he becomes the disciple. And he is going to make sure that wherever injustice is in the world, he'll be there, because he represents that. Um, the other symbolism, I think, is Rosa Sharon. She starts off as somebody very practical, a bit of a daydreamer. She, um, by the end of the novel, she becomes almost saint-like in her selfless act with the dying man. Um, and prior to that, at the loss of her baby, her stillborn baby, when Uncle John sends the baby in the apple box down the river, that's Moses. So there's so much... And, and John Steinbeck readily admitted that he borrowed a lot from the Bible for his symbolism. Uh, he also borrowed from uh, Julia Ward Howe uh, uh, the title, The Grapes of Wrath, at the request of his wife, his first wife, Carol. Um, I just love the story, and I love the movie, and I can't tell you which I love more, I think equally. Um, a few things about the movie. Uh, Jane Darwell was not John Ford's first pick. Mm -hmm. sure. His first pick was a wonderful character actress named Beulah Bondi. Beulah Bondi's probably best remembered as Jimmy Stewart's mother in It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, Jane Darwell was an equally impressive character actress, and I think she was born for the role of Macho. She was a native of Missouri. 
Uh, she came from a privileged family. Her father was a president of a railroad, and he did not approve of her going into acting. So she changed her name from Patty Woodward to Jane Darwell so she wouldn't sully the family name. Um, Natalie Johnson, uh, with the approval of John Steinbeck in places, uh, wrote the screenplay. And I think he did an excellent job because it, it, it would have been very hard in that time to film the ending of the book. If it was done today, and Lord, I hope it never does. <laughs> uh, that ensemble cast was perfect. Um, Tom, uh, Tom Joad. Henry Fonda was born to play that role. He was a native of Grand Island, Nebraska. He grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. He, he knew the, the area, he knew the people, he had the accent. Some of the other character actors, uh, Charlie Grapewin played the grandfather, and he's also best remembered as Uncle Henry in The Wizard of Oz. And he has a distinction of being in the most films of any character actor. Um, as far as the children, uh, I do know uh, Daryl Hickman is the only member of that ensemble cast alive today. He played Winfield. Uh, <laughs> I just know a little trivia here and there. Um, I, I'm curious uh, how you feel about the symbolism. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. You know, you mentioned the flood. This is a Moses image, but again, it's it's not a. I think when writers use biblical imagery, that it isn't always a straight parallel to what's going on, right? You know, so it's you know he's taking a dead baby and he's putting it in the box and he's pushing it down. And he's like, you go tell him. And and so it's not you know the Moses figure that's going to come and. Save everyone. It's it is. It's a dead child, and and my first thought was that that was a commentary on the American dream. You know that that you know the American dream has become a stillbirth. Um, you know, and I I think that you know I I I, I thought about that, and then I thought about the ending. idea that it starts off with dust and it goes to the flood, and, you know, and, and if you say, okay, well, this is a biblical allusion to the flood, well, you know, where do you go with that? Well, in the, in the Bible, after the flood, God indicates that he's never going to flood the earth again, you know, and, and what what's being washed away, where do you go? The other thing that's really interesting, if you're going to take it from a kind of a Christian perspective, is there's there's this kind of heightened level of Darwinianism in the book, too. You know, there are these people that just kind of disappear. They don't survive. <laughs> they keep just, you know, they just fall by the wayside. You know, and um, you've got Noah, who stays in the Colorado River, you know, who's just going to kind of wander off. You've got um, Connie, who, who disappears. Um, you've got Ma and Grandpa, who die. Uh, and, and this idea that through this, through this progression, those members of the family that can actually survive will survive, and so the survival of the fittest idea. Um, the turtle, I love. I thought the turtle chapter was, you know, when I read the turtle chapter, I was like, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, I, and I think it's an allegory, you know, an allegorical image for uh, for the Jones and, and for the for the migrants themselves, um, and kind of pushing forward. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's where I am. I, I look at the symbolism of the, the grandfather and the grandmother dying. Uh, elderly people tend not to want to move. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we like our, we're used to our space, we're used to being, you know, finding certain things and being able to get from one place to another. And so we tend not to like to move. So I saw the symbol of this, the younger ones being able to move on, elderly not being able to, just did not have the will, did not want to leave home. Uh, so I saw that as a symbolism of, of, of the generational differences of 
people understanding the place. Uh, you know, more than likely, their parents were buried there, and this is home, and they just did not want to leave it. Uh, so I, that kind of symbolism uh, played for me. But even when you think of the, of, of the title, The Grace of Breath, what is, what is that in the Bible? Well, not the Bible, but... In the Bible? In the, oh. in the, yes, in the Bible. Uh, you know, my eyes have seen the glory. Uh, and, and so he is, he does, you're absolutely right, he does pull a lot from, from the religious images. Yeah. I have to agree with you on the uh, uh, older people and perhaps their sense of place because the character of Emily Graves, uh, he's a ghost of what used to be there on the land. Uh, it's so bleak in that beginning. And of course his name is Mule. Mule and, right. and Graves too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, confusing to yeah. I, I think, you know, you were talking about grandmother dying on the, you know, in the back of the truck there. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is, is the juxtaposition of the fact that Connie and Rosa Sharon are making love in the back of the truck yeah. as she's dying. Yeah. You know, and so again, where do you, you know, where do you go with that? You know, what's what's the uh, one going out in creation? Yeah, yeah, but the creation becomes, you know, the creation that she produces is still is a still stale. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and is you know the reference to the battle in the Republic of the Republic is. Um, The idea is, is you know, he is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He and loose the faithful lightning of this terrible swift sword of his truth is marching on, which is the first verse. Um, you know, but the chapter with that is a little bit different. You know, um, so this is uh, chapter 25, which is the greatest chapter. Um, and he's talking about the, the, the corruption of, of the grapes. Um, the people come with nets to fish for potatoes in the river, and the guards hold them back. They come in rattling cars to get dumped oranges with the kerosene is sprayed. They stand still and watch the potatoes float by, listen to the screaming pigs being killed in a ditch and covered with quicklime, watch the mountains of oranges slop down to a putrefying ooze. And in the eyes of the people, there is a failure. And in the eyes of the hungry, there is the growing wrath. And the souls of the people, the grapes of wrath, are filling and growing heavy, growing heavy for the vintage. You know, I, I think, you know, in that sense, the novels calling for, you know, calling for God to come and do something. Uh, and it's interesting because the, 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 the lyrics were actually set to the music for John Brown's body, which, you know, and, and so the song is associated with the Civil War. Um, and <coughs> so if Seinbeck is intending for us to be kind of imagining that this is a moment when somebody needs to come in and, and take action. Um, you know, why why again do we end the flood? And why, you know, why is it the family? Why don't we see the, the landowners, you know, trying to hide from the flood? Um, you know, it's there's a great story by uh, Flannery and Connor called The Life You Save Maybe Your Own. And uh, the character in that is Tom T. Shiflet, and he's a he's a Satan figure. Um, and at the end of the novel, or at the end of the short story, he looks at the skies and he says, God, wash away the slime from the earth. And then all of a sudden he hears the raindrops coming and he hits the gas of the car so he can escape it. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, so I'm wondering about why, why, don't we, why don't we see any of the retribution beyond Tom killing a man in that one moment. And the other thing is, is if Tom is the... You know, Tom is the disciple, the prophet, the, the, the one who's taking Casey's message forward and the, and the message of, you know, unions, uh, the message of the common laborer and, and standing up. But, you know, there are aspects to Tom's character that are seem counterintuitive to the, the idea of Christianity in that he kills a man and he feels no remorse. You know, I don't feel sorry I've done it, but I, I do it again. You know, I mean, 
gave the guy that killed, you know, he went to jail for. You know, you know, it just happened. You know, he, he took me on and all the party. And, you know. I think when he says that he, he is just a, a small part of a bigger soul. Yeah, the over soul. Right. I think that's how he uh, comes to terms with what he's done. Well, you know, the oversoul is an interesting idea because, you know, this is where, you know, and, and this is where some of the lyricism of the novel, which is really lovely, comes out. You know, I think Steinbeck's being influenced by people like Emerson and Whitman. You know, and, and Emerson wrote a great deal in nature about the oversoul. Um, and, and, of course, he was, uh, he upset a lot of ministers, um, which, you know, what he said was, is, you know, I am part of So, um, he wasn't invited back to Harvard for a while. Uh, but, you know, and, and of course, Whitman in Leaves of Grass and, and, and in uh, Song of Myself, in the, in the final uh, poem of Song of Myself, which I think is 52 or something like that, he talks about um, being like a, a drop of water falling into the ocean and dispersing. It's very similar to the speech by um, by uh, Tom Ma, where he talks about the you can find it. Yeah. Uh, Transcendental. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. so we open it up for comments, questions. Not that we can answer them. I'm just going to toss them over to the <laughs> I'll toss them back. Yeah. Yeah. The junior and the go. The great image at the beginning. You see the grapes represent, of course, the grapes.